come to my session, I was just saying I know I'm up against stiff competition for this time slot. Uh, I've talked to the other presenters who are presenting at this time, and I'm just like, ah, it was bad enough I was up against one of you. I have to be up against all three of you. But that's right. I think this is a very important topic: uh, how to choose an open source license, especially related to Drupal, because I feel like most of the time, since we know Drupal is open source, we kind of just we don't think about what that means and, and what open source licensing means. So it's a, an important thing. Um, I think so. So just a little bit about myself before we get started. I'm Mike Miles. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. I got out here just escaping a nor'easter. Well, I didn't escape it. I had a shovel that morning. Um, we did the same. We came from New York. All right. So yeah, you know exactly. Uh, I got dumped with a bunch of snow, and then I'm here. But I've been working with Drupal for almost a decade now. Uh, I'm doing everything on the side when it comes to Drupal from theme development to module development. Uh, most of the time now, I do large-scale architecture. Uh, I'm also the lead organizer for the Boston Drupal Meetup, which meets the first Tuesday of every month. So if you're ever in Boston, come on down. Uh, we have free pizza and beer. That's not why you should come. But <laughs> uh, And uh, you know, I have all the grandmaster stuff and all that thing, so good for me. Um, during the day, I am the senior technical solutions manager for a digital marketing company called Genuine. Uh, sorry, digital marketing agency. Uh, what Genuine does is we're not a Drupal shop, but we the, the tagline is we build agile brands so that they stay culturally relevant. And what that means uh, is that we, we make brands easier to love for their consumers. And we really try to figure out what's going to reach people authentically, you know, genuinely. And, and how we can help. And we do that a lot of different ways. We have a whole, we're a whole full service to agency, so we're not a Drupal shop. So we have a digital strategy department, we have SEO and content um, creators, we have on site video and, and production, uh, also creative and design, and then development, which is in three areas .NET, uh, front end technologies like React and SAS and all that fun stuff, and Node, and then uh, the PHP team that I help lead up, um, which we mainly do Drupal. And that's during the day, and then at night I have the podcast Developing Up, which is focused on the non-technical side of being a developer. So what that means is we talk about things on the podcast such as uh, how to work on a team, how to give and receive feedback, or the episode that's coming out on Tuesday, um, how to deal with imposter syndrome. So I've been doing that for almost two years now. Um, check it out. I, I think it's a good podcast, but I'm a little biased. Uh, if you want to know any more about me, you can find me anywhere on the internet at MikeMiles86, from Twitter to D.O. to LinkedIn to uh, name a web service, I don't know, a social network. Not Facebook, though. I'm not on Facebook. So what I'm going to talk about today uh, is three things. I already said that you know, in Drupal, we know it's open source. We don't really care about the licensing, but it, it, it's an important thing to to know about. So I want to explain why you would choose an open source license for a project and what it actually means. Uh, I want to explain what open source licenses are, just to give a general understanding and some background, and then how to choose the right license for your project, because not all projects are the same, even in Drupal, and if you're working on related to Drupal, you may want to do a different open source license, and there's a lot of them. I'm, I'm double checking to make sure I spelled license correct. I did. Great. Um, before getting into that, though, caveat, I am not a lawyer. I am nowhere near a lawyer. And intellectual property law is big and complicated, um, I assume. Uh, no, I think it is. So anything I'm going to tell you is not legal advice for when you put a license on a project and then maybe get sued or try to sue somebody and just say, well, this guy at a conference told me that licenses work <laughs> this way. No, this, this general information, it's not legally advice. So I am not a lawyer. Just can't <laughs> stress that enough. Um, the other statement I want to make before I really get into it is something that I believe, or not even that I just believe, but something that's fundamentally true is that code is art. So how many people in the room are developers? All right, almost like 75% of the room. <laughs> um, Speaking as a developer, I can say code is art because I love looking at the things that I build and how clever I can be and how clever other people are. Uh, and just like, look at this, isn't this amazing? Um, but from a legal sense, code is actually art. It's creative works. It's treated the same way as if you were to paint a picture or write a book. As soon as you create that, that piece of art, that piece of creative work, you have a copyright claim on it. 
or you know, in terms of code, you and your team have a copyright claim. So if you were to just put your code out there, as soon as you write it, it's copyrighted, you own the rights to it. What does that mean? Copyright is basically the rules that are set up, the laws that are established, they're different throughout different countries, um, that say who can distribute that creative work. So in terms of software, you have the code you write, you, it's copyrighted, you are the only sole person, or you and your team are the people who are allowed to say, person A and person B, you can have a copy of this code. Take it, do what we want with it, or pay us a licensing fee to, to use it. However you want to distribute it, you're the only person who can do that. Which means if you give your code to person A on the top, they cannot go ahead and just give it to other people uh, without reaching some other agreement with you. They're not allowed to do that. They'd be in some sort of legal breach, and you have the right to then sue them for damages or for, for what? Other intellectual property stuff. Okay, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know lawyerly terms. So copyright is basically, it's the legal right of the creator uh, to control how their software is distributed. You can't control how it's used, but you can control how it gets out there so people can use it. Now, what this also means is when you write software, only you can define its use. In terms of, you can't say, once I give it to you, you can only use it in these, surf, um, these places, but you can determine because you're the only person who can work on it, how it can be used. So, so let's say this is a piece of GPS software that we write, and we're going to make it apply to boat navigation. And we write it very specifically for its boat navigation. That's the only way it can be used. This means it's copyrighted. No one else can help you with it. Maybe your GPS software can be used for autonomous vehicles. Maybe it can be used for autonomous rocket ships. So maybe Tesla and SpaceX could use your software. It's copyrighted. They have no access to it unless they're going to pay you for it. They probably won't pay you for it, though. But if you're not thinking about these avenues, you're not going to be able to make your code as useful as possible, or your software as useful as possible. Because your code is copyrighted, only you can create improvements to it. So we have our GPS software for boat navigation. If someone were to come along and say, oh, sorry, if you were to say, I'm going to add a fancy GUI on top of it, you can add to it. You have the right to do it. You can change your code however you want to. But if someone else comes along and says, hey, you know what? I can make your um, software 10 times more accurate. Can I give this to you? Well, one, because they're writing a piece of software, they have copyright claim on their software. So it's kind of weird, because then they can't give it to you. Because then if their code gets added to your copyrighted project, who then owns the copyright for the whole thing? right? Where does their add-on stop and your original code begin? It becomes this whole crazy legal mishmash. And it, it, so you basically can't do it. So that, that's what happens when you write software. That's the copyright rules or what a copyright gives you. But I always go back and think, you know, why do we write software? This is more of an existential question, I guess. Um, you know, for the developers in the room, why do we write code? I believe that we write code because we want to solve the world's problems. Right? Every developer seeks out, to, they see a problem, they want to create a solution, they do it with code. We want to serve the whole world's problems, but as individual developers, we only have certain viewpoints. We can only uh, approach things from our experience in, in one way. That may not be the way to solve problems for other people. So open sourcing your software opens it up to the world. And, and that's what we want to do. If we want to write code to solve problems and solve as many problems as possible, we need people to tell us what their problems are and help us use our software to, to solve those. That's why you do open source software. Now, open source licenses allow you to open source, quote unquote, open source your software. This is not removing your copyright claim. It is adjusting your copyright so that others can freely use your software, modify it, share it, um, and add to it, while you still get all the protections that come with writing your software, you or your team. You can still say how it can be distributed, you can say how it can be added onto, but people don't have to worry that they can't contribute to a project. Because if you just put your software out there without any sort of license at all, people are going to assume it's copyrighted, it's proprietary, and they can't do anything with it. Now there's the naive thought, not really in the Drupal community since we work with an open source product, but that open source equals free. And this is not true. We all know this. We, we work with open source software every day, but we all make money. 
well, I assume most of us make money. Um, and the way this works is because, yes, if you release software with an open source license saying, hey, other people can get the copy of the source code, they can use it, modify it, uh, you can't really bar them from taking it for free, but you can then offer services that either build open source software, you can have services around using open source software, like if you work at an agency like I do, you know, we build for clients with open source tools, and then we sell our expertise for building those, putting those pieces together. So there's still plenty of ways to make money as a developer, as an agency, with open source code. Now, what an open source license does for your creative work, for your, your code, is, again, you still have that copyright claim, but if you open source, you remove like the proprietariness of your code, and you allow for derivatives. So a derivative is basically, we have our GPS software for ships, we've open sourced it, others can access it, Someone can create uh, a derivative of it, or a fork, you know, if you're used to GitHub terminology, a fork. Uh, they can make their own modifications, and they can apply it to autonomous vehicles, right? Someone else can take it, they have the right to change it, and they can apply it to a different industry for uh, autonomous rocket ships. So again, yay, um, Tesla and SpaceX are using our software, that's great. Uh, a derivative is just an alteration or extension of a piece of software. When you provide an open source license, it informs people that you are allowed, they are allowed to make derivatives of your code. It also means, oh, an example for Drupal, I forgot to add a Drupal example, and it's hard to see on the screen, but Drupal and Backdrop is a great example of a derivative. Just about two years ago, when Drupal was just about to push out Drupal 8, which came with a whole bunch of changes in, in the structure of things, there is a community, a group in the community who thought, we like the way Drupal 7 is, we were afraid that people aren't going to really gravitate to the new changes in Drupal 8, uh, or we want to protect people who want to keep going with Drupal 7. So they created a derivative of Drupal. They called it Backdrop. There's a whole new community out there. Uh, and they're able to do that because Drupal is open source. Drupal says anyone who wants this can take it and make a, uh, a copy of it and change it. And so now there's this whole Backdrop community. And they are running, doing their own thing. They've since diverged from Drupal. Um, but they're still tied to Drupal because of the licensing, which I'll get into in a little bit. I don't know where my title went. <laughs> uh, there we go. All right, so if you're open sourcing your software and you remove your proprietary claim to it, but you still have the copyright, again, what that allows you to do is to get improvements from the world, from other developers. So say we have our add-on, our, our GUI interface. Now that person comes along that says, hey, I want to give you this this code that will make your software 10 times better. Great, no problem, you can, you can add it on. There are some little complications here we'll get into in a little bit about how that works. Someone else can come along with a different addition and say, hey, this will make this work even better. Someone else can come along and say, this will make it even better. Because you've open sourced it, people know they can contribute to it, they can add on to it, they can build stuff that works with your software, uh, and they don't have to worry about you going after them and, and suing them for doing that. Example in Drupal is contrib, something we're all used to doing, or we all know is the Drupal contrib space. People contributing patches to Drupal core. People producing themes to add to Drupal and make available for others. People writing modules and providing modules to Drupal that can get merged into core, like say the views module. Right? Because Drupal is open source, it tells people you can contribute to this and you can add on to it, um, and it, it makes Drupal better for everybody. So you say, this is great, I want people to use my software, I want people to add on to it, why do I even need a license at all? Can I just say, here's my software, I have no proprietary claims to it, use it at your own will? Yes, you can, it's called the unlicense. Um, it's as close as you can get in terms of software as saying this is in the public domain. It basically strips all your copyright claims of your software, which you may want to do, uh, but there's some complications in there where public domain and unlicensing is very different um, around the world and what that means and what that allows. It also means um, because you remove your copyright claims, you don't get credit for the hard work you did. And if you're a developer, you like getting credit for the work you do because you don't get it a lot of the time because it's behind the scenes. Um, so you could do an unlicensed, but why not use an open source license for your software instead of an unlicensed? Um, Doing so gives you some protections from just unlicensing. So if we have our software, it's open source, 
we apply, we can take our open source software and we can put it in a distribution or a package. This package we can make proprietary. We can close source that. We don't have to give that out uh, in some cir circumstances. And then we can sell that package to the boating industry. So we can have our general GPS software package it in a nice little thing, hey, GPS for boats. And we sell that package. That still provides somebody to make a uh, derivative of our GPS software, and they can apply it still to, to cars. Someone else can take it, and that's fine. Someone else could take it, and what if they wanted to make a derivative, put our software in a package that then they make proprietary, and they want to then sell it to the boating industry. If you had unlicensed your software, and there's nothing to stop anyone from doing that. You, you're inviting competition, which you may want to do. But you can provide with an uh, open source license, you can say anyone can use this under these conditions. You can protect your individual use of that software. Um, big companies do this, like Facebook, which I'll get into. Um, they provide uh, patent claims that say, you can use our software for free, for whatever you want, except for anything that goes after our patented proprietary work. Uh, and, and that allows you to, to differentiate yourself from the others. Now, open source licenses, there's a lot of them. How would you know which ones to use? Well, there's this company, not company, organization called the Open Source Initiative. They've been around since 1998. And all they do are evaluate licenses and say, yes, you can claim to be an open source license, or no, you cannot, because you do not meet our conditions. And their criteria is all about protecting the rights of the creator of the work and the rights of the people who are going to use that open source software. They have a lot of criteria they use. I want to highlight a couple of them. Number one, an open source license must be free. You can't say, hey, here's my shiny open source license you can give to your projects if you pay me to use it. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. I don't know how that would happen. Um, actually, someone tried to do that last year um, in the Drupal community. They tried to say, hey, for protection, you guys should use my license and pay me for it. I don't know what that person was trying to do. Um, a good idea, but. <laughs> right? If you think of practice, you just be like, I'm just going to write a license and, and sell it. Um, most open source licenses have a clause that say you must re require, you must provide access to the source code. So if you have an open source license, the clause says you must make the um, compiled code and the uncompiled code, if you're doing compiled languages, available for anyone who wants it. And then uh, the criteria that it must allow for the creations of altered works, for derivatives and for add-ons. Um, these are like the, the three top criteria, I guess this, yeah, the three top criteria that every license has um, that's open source, as well as the most important, a clause about providing attribution to the originator, the originator of the work. So anyone any, who has open source license, there's a clause that says, you must give credit where credit's due um, in your project that uses this license. Now there's two types of open source licenses. There's a lot of licenses out there, but there's two main types. First is what's known as a permissive license. This is as close as you can get to an unlicensed well, without being an unlicensed, without being in the, the public domain. Some permissive licenses are so basic, they just have that uh, clause about giving attributions. Um, they, they're they very simple, very basic. They come usually with a thing that you use this code at your own risk as is, and you can't come after me and say, hey, your code broke my project. You're like, well, it's open source. You can't. Give me, don't give me credit for breaking it, but just give me credit for using it. Uh, and then there's copy left licenses, which is a play on the term copyright. It basically uses the rules around copyright to negate copyright. Um, they add additional clauses on top of permissive licenses, um, such as patent clauses or really strict ways on how a piece of software can be used and the, the situations that can be distributed. So break these down a little bit further. Permissive licenses work a little bit like this. So we have our software our GPS software, let's say, and we put a permissive license on it, like the MIT license. Someone can take our software and make a derivative of it, and because the permissive license just says you have to give me credit for it, that person can apply a whole different license to their software, to their derivative. They can take yours, change it, 
slap a different type of license on it, um, and it's all good. It's fine. It's legal to do. Someone else can have an add-on for your project, and they can apply a different license to their add-on uh, to sit on top of yours, and they can do that. Now, these licenses have to kind of work together, but they can be different. They can have different clauses, different patent claims, whatnot. With a permissive license, you can still take your open source software, you can put it to your proprietary package, uh, and that's fine. You're allowed to do that. A uh, permissive license basically just protects um, the, the originator's credit, but it does not put any restrictions on add-ons, distributions, or derivatives that they have to use the same license. This is not the case in Drupal, which I'm going to get to in a moment. Uh, but this is in the case, say, for, I want to say jQuery, but I haven't looked at the license. But I would imagine like JavaScript frameworks probably work more with permissive license. Copy left license is a little more strict. So you have your software, you put a copy left license on it, like the most widely known and the original open source license, the uh, GPL license, let's say. And what copy left licenses say is that if someone creates a derivative, they must use the same exact license as the original work. If someone creates an add-on, that add-on must use the same exact license as the original work. If someone creates and adds that project, that code, to a distribution, that distribution must use the same exact license as the original work. It perpetuates uh, keeping things open and free in open source. It prevents anyone from locking you down there. Right. Exactly. It prevents anyone from locking it down and for, for using it for, for their own proprietary gains. Um, there's still ways you can use it in proprietary code, but again, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't tell you all the specifics of that. Now, copy left licenses actually fall into two subtypes. I mean, it, actually, it's, a, it's really like a spectrum, but there's two main types. There's weak copy left, which weak copy left have clauses that just protect uh, derivatives and add-ons. They say if you alter my code or if you want to add to my code, you have to use the same license. And this is like the LGPL uh, license, the lesser general, whatever the, 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 the acronym is, I don't know. So that's weak copy left. Then there's strong copy left, which covers all three scenarios, saying no matter how this software is going to be used, um, that use has to have the same exact license, it has to be copy left covers all three scenarios. And this is what uh, Drupal uses. Drupal uses the GPL license, which is the most strong copy left license you can have. And it says anything that uses Drupal itself must be copy left licenses. Now just to show uh, some of the popular OSI approved licenses, strong copy left, you have the GPL license, Eclipse, weak copy left, the LGPL or the Mozilla license, and permissive that just say, give me credit where credit's due is, permit is MIT and Apache. Each one of these are slightly different from each other. They, they have different clauses. They have slight changes that say how software can be used and, and how they protect um, the users and the originators and the limitations around the software. These are just six of like 80 open source licenses that are available. So how do you decide what type of license to use in your open source project? It's really not that hard. Um, there's actually only four questions you have to ask yourself to determine it. Question number one, what licenses are already in use in your software? Did you use Drupal? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but if, if you have software and you're just like, I'm gonna write everything from scratch, then you can choose whatever license you want. But if you say, hey, there's this library that already handles, let's say, logging, I'm just gonna pull that into my project. Well, what license does that software have? Are they strong copy left? If so, then if you wanna use them, you have to be strong copy left. If they're permissive, then you have more flexibility in what you want to use. If they're proprietary licenses, then why would you even want to, want to use them in your open source project? So it's important to pay attention because if you don't, you pull a project in and then you don't agree to their licensing terms, you're in violation, you can open yourself to legal issues. So check what licenses are used in any other software or libraries you include. Then, one thing that people always overlook is what are the terms of service where my software is hosted? If you want to distribute your code, make it open source, which means you want to give it out, you can't. Write code for yourself and be like, it's open source, and nobody can get it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's open source to you, I guess. Um, so you have to put your code somewhere. 
Uh, if you use, say, GitHub or Drupal.org, or if you're a WordPress developer, you put it on WordPress, or however you host WordPress things, they all have terms of service that dictate rules around what licensing or how your software has to work. For example, uh, the term services on GitHub, if you have code on GitHub, says any code host on GitHub must allow for the creation of forks, for the creation of derivatives. Now, you can make private derivatives, you only give access to certain people, but as soon as you give someone access to your code on GitHub, you cannot prevent them from making a copy of it and changing it. That's what the term of service say you have to allow for. So you can put code on GitHub that has a license that says you can't create a derivative. If you host your code on GitHub on Drupal.org, Drupal.org says anything that's hosted on us must follow um, our rules for giving access to the code. Uh, and because of the way Drupal is, it's GPL, um, you have to use the GPL license. So where are you going to host your code? What rules are in place that dictate what license you have to use? Finally, something you can kind of control is with your software, do you want derivatives, additions, and distributions to have to use the same exact license as you? If you do, then you want to copy left license. If you care about how your software is going to be used, um, you want to copy left license. If you don't care, you're like, I just want credit, and I want people to use my software, permissive license. And actually, you only have to ask yourself three questions, and you're good. If you do decide to copy left, then ask yourself, can others use my software in their own proprietary works? Do I care if they get monetary gains and they put my software in closed source? If you say, sure, people can do that, that's fine. Weak copy left because you want to protect against derivatives and add-ons, but you don't care if it gets added to a distribution. But if you're like, no, no matter what, open source all the way, baby, uh, strong copy left is the way to go. So asking yourself so these four questions, it's like a decision tree, you can figure out what type of license you want. Strong copy left, weak copy left, or permissive. Great Mike, you say, but come on, what license specifically should I use in my projects? Tell me. Uh, I can't. <laughs> that takes some self-investigation. Um, there are a lot of licenses out there. There's over 80. There's 80 plus. Um, but what I can share with you are some guidelines. First and foremost, Use a license that has been approved by the OSI. Since 1998, they've been reviewing licenses to make sure they protect everybody who uses that software. You could go to uh, the dark web and you could be like, oh, I found a license here. <laughs> but unless you're like, you know legalese, you may be screwing yourself over. Read the license before you use it. Now this can be hard. Licenses are not the most thrilling thing. Maybe if you're stuck with no power because of a nor'easter and you happen to have licenses on your computer that has plenty of battery, sure, you know, sit by the fire and enjoy it. Um, there's a great website called tldrlegal.com, which has all the licenses you can imagine, and they translate it into basic English. It's a good resource. Yeah, it's a really great resource. They also do it for some terms of services for websites too, and they just say, here's what it protects, here's what it allows, here's what it doesn't protect against. Uh, they also claim they're not a legal service, they're just providing uh, a better way for you to digest the information. So if you're deciding on using a specific license, read it to make sure you understand what the clauses and the implications of that license are. And then, do not change your license once you've released your software. As Soon as you put open source software out there on the web for others to use and distribute, you have to assume someone made a copy of it, they already made a distri uh, distribution, or sorry, a derivative. And if you were to say, I'm gonna put a permissive license on my software, put it out there, and then someone makes a copy, and then you say, actually, I'm going to change it to be GPL, then that person who made a co copy is, they're not in compliance with your license, and then who can sue who? What's, it's all this crazy stuff. Um, now, what you can do is create a new release of your software and change the license then. Famous example from last year. Facebook has um, React.js. They released it under the, uh, I think it was the BSD license uh, with a, uh, uh, I don't know if it was custom, but with a um, patent claim on it. That basically said, if you use uh, Reveal, no sorry, React, <coughs> you can't sue Facebook for any reason, ever. You can't <laughs> claim any copyright infringement from Facebook. If people are like, whoa, 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 whoa. 
Yeah, I remember I was talking to someone who's making this, they, they couldn't use it for that reason. Like, right, right. Yeah. People are like, whoa, that's, uh, Facebook does a lot of stuff, they have a lot more resources than us, and I can't claim any patent infringement against them. Ever. Ever, in like <laughs> for perpetuity, anything. for anything. <laughs> I don't know about that. So like the WordPress community, WordPress was actually building uh, React into WordPress, and they were like, no, we're gonna drop support for, for React. You can't, how do you? Right, you could, because they can't control who uses it. So all these uh, web tools were, were dropping support, and Facebook was like, no, 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 we want you to use our stuff. <laughs> So they actually created a new release of React and they, they got rid of that patent claim and they, they actually made it, they added a permissive license. And everyone's like, cool, we're gonna, we're gonna adopt React. And people like, yes, people are using React. Yeah. Um, it's great for them, it's great for everybody. Um, so you can't change your license once you release it, but when you create a new release, you can change the license. Okay, okay, Mike, but come on. We're at a Drupal conference. What license specifically should I use in my Drupal projects? If I'm, if I'm building websites with Drupal, if I'm building products with Drupal, if I'm building modules or themes or patches, come on, what license should I use? Well, go back to that first question. And someone in the audience already mentioned this. What licenses are already used in my software? You're building something for Drupal. Drupal uses the GPL 2.0 or higher license, um, which, state, which is a strong copyleft license, which means Anything you build for Drupal must have the GPL license on it. Now, GPL, the way I understand it, it covers that thing directly, but if you were to use other libraries in your project or libraries were using other libraries, they could have different licenses somehow, but your thing that's contributing to Drupal has to use the same license as Drupal. Now, what's, if you don't do that, what's gonna happen to you? Probably not, nothing really, but you know, why put yourself in that predicament for your clients that you, you write code for or, or your company? So to recap, I think we all already know this, because we're Drupalists, but your open source projects can change the world. If you have proprietary code, you can only change the world so much, because you only have your perspective. So open source. When you do open source, uh, it allows your software to be freely used, modified, and shared, uh, but it only does that when you apply an open source license. If you don't apply a license, people are gonna assume it's proprietary, people are gonna assume that uh, they can't use it or do anything well with it, and you don't want that, you want people to use your software. And then select the right open source license for your project by asking the right questions. What other libraries am I using? What are their licenses? Where am I going to host my code? What are the rules around there? Do I care how people use my software? And do I really care if they use it for proprietary purposes? They'll give you the decision to know if you use strong copyleft, weak copyleft, or permissive. And then you can go from there. Um, so yeah, that's what I have for this. So I want to list some resources. First bit.ly link here, mid 18 OSL is this presentation. It's all on Google Slides, which I haven't read the term service, but it's kind of, I think it's open source, <laughs> right? So you can make a derivative of it if you wanted to. Um, opensource.org is the open source initiatives website. Um, check them out. Uh, they have a listing of all the open source licenses. Uh, and then if you want to read them, uh, you can go on the, the bottom right there, tldrlegal.com, to, to read them and understand them. Choosealicense.com is a fun tool by GitHub, which uh, reduces the number of questions you have to ask and it, it gives you, basically it helps you make a decision what license you need. It pretty much asks you, what are you thinking of using? Here are three recommendations. Um, my bad Bentley link, uh, Drupal Lick, Drupal LIC, uh, that's a link to Drupal.org's licensing page, which tells you uh, the rules and regulations around uh, Drupal projects. And then a uh, plug for my podcast, Developing Up, um, again, the non-technical side being a developer. New episode on Tuesday uh, about imposter syndrome. And then finally, come visit the East Coast. Uh, from Boston, we have a lot of conferences coming up in the Drupal space. Uh, Nerd Summit is next weekend. That's probably a little too late for you to book a flight. Um, but uh, from New York, you can make the drive. Yeah. I, drove, I drove to New Jersey camp um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, what's that? Um, no, like for a second one. Like for 27. Drupal Delphia. Yeah, well, that one. Uh, that's a one-day Drupal conference in Philadelphia. I should live by Philly. Yeah? 
Yeah, like I'm from Baltimore. All right. So, so like two hours. So there you go. I, I don't know too much about this. I just know it's coming up and they're still accepting session submissions. Okay. Um, it's on a Friday, but uh, I know a lot of Google companies in Philadelphia and it's, it's a really good meeting. Yeah. Uh, Design for Drupal, which is the only uh, front end design specific Drupal conference that I know of. They're, we're celebrating our 10th year. Um, it's uh, in June. Uh, that's in Boston. Yeah, it's, it's a really so good. Where, where is it? Uh, it's at the MIT Sata Center, I think. Oh, so it's back at MIT? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, back at MIT. Yeah, I like that. Nice. Yeah, uh, it's a really fun conference. It's a great time to be in the city. Uh, and then NetCamp, which I am one of the organizers of, which is the New England Drupal Camp. Uh, we haven't settled on the date, but it's November ish. Uh, so keep your eyes out for that. That's also a fun one to come to. Uh, with that, we have some time for questions. If you have any, if not, you can hit me up on Twitter about anything Drupal or tech related. Um, but then, before any questions you may have, I ask for applause. Thank you for all the people who are standing in the back. I appreciate you not. Yeah, I'm sorry there were no chairs available. Uh, are there any questions? If I don't put a license on my code at all. All right, question one What happens if I don't put a license on my code at all? And then publish it to like GitHub. And then publish it. Say you put your code on GitHub, you don't put a license on it. Well, one, because you put it on uh, GitHub, people can assume they can make a derivative of it, because they're allowed to. But if you don't have any license specifically called out, people have to assume it's your proprietary code, that they're not allowed to make copies of it or add to it. Um, is that going to stop people from doing it? No. People are going to copy it. Um, but legally, you could, if you find someone using your code, you'd be like, uh-uh, this isn't open source. I'm going to sue you. I decided to put it on GitHub to track. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I bet there, I bet there are code trolls out there who do that. I'm sure there are. Right? Good question. Yeah. Where does the line end? I mean, in terms of like, you know, we use a lot of tools to build uh, open source tools to build our tools. Yeah. So and, and we call out to different APIs and things like that. So like with a Drupal module, it's pretty clear where we're embedding our code directly within the context of Drupal. But like if we're we're calling an API or maybe even using a different programming language or something like that. It is are there clear lines in terms of where the license ends and where a new license can begin? Yeah. So the question was, are there clear lines where like the license ends, where it begins, what it covers? Yeah. And. Uh, in your question, you asked about, uh, you know, what if we connect to an API? That's a great example, and they actually talk about this um, on the open source licensing website, I think. They talk about it, where that's a great way to get around restrictions, say, for the GPL. So if you're building a Drupal module and you want to use data from a proprietary system, or you want to write code in a proprietary way, you just build the API connector. And then what you're getting is the data that that open source code or that closed source code generates. Not, and that, so. Not the code itself. The code itself is what's protected, but what's generated from it is not. So again, if you use open source tools for generating other code, that code you generate is, pr is the production of that. It's not necessarily copyrighted or following the same license. It's copyrighted. It's not following the same license. Um, so that's a great way. If you're like, I really want to use this library or the code that this library produces, but I can't connect to it directly, see if you can figure out a way to do it through APIs, because you're interacting with the code, but you're not pulling it into your project. So it, I think it's, again, not, not a lawyer, but it extends to if you're adding code to your project directly, that's where the licensing applies. If you're just making calls out to other services, your license doesn't carry through those calls. So you're really just a user of that. You're just right. You're just a user of that. Mm -hmm. Same thing if you're like, I don't want to open source my software, but I want others to benefit from it. Uh, you produce an API that people can call to, and they can get the results of, of what your code does, for example. So it's a good question. All set? Okay. Are there licensing restrictions on like package management tools? Oh, are there license restrictions on package management tools? I'm going to say there probably are because those um, package management tools themselves are code. Well, no, I'm more like if I publish on that packages, ah. do I have to have a certain license? I would assume that if you put something on packages, I guarantee you packages has a page somewhere about their licensing policy because your code, well actually, your code doesn't really get hosted on Packagist, it just gets passed, well, you produce something that stays on Packagist. 
Just a JSON? Yeah, just a JSON file. So I'm sure they have rules that say they must, because putting on packages, you're saying other people can download this without telling me. Yeah. So there's definitely guidelines on there that say, well, your code has to allow that. Again, you can't be a code troll. Okay. No. I know you specifically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle, I don't mean to say that. I bet there are. I bet any place, any service where they say, hey, put your code on us, um, they have uh, rules around what licensing or at least some sort of restrictions that you have to follow, guidelines. Good question. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I know I'll stop the recording and then I'll talk. Bye, everybody at home. <laughs>